Welcome to the MVM review of Walking in Burano. This is a one to four player game from Emperor S4, also gonna be brought over to the States from Deepwater Games. It's an Essen release, and it's all about building out the city of Burano, which is in Italy. Yeah, if you haven't seen Burano firsthand or in one of the few games that have already been published around Burano, it is probably one of the most colorful cities ever. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and certainly if you look at these cards, you can get a sense. The buildings along the canals in Burano are all multiple, multiple colors. Yeah. Super colorful game, very easy to teach and play. So it's going to take place in about 30 minutes. What you're doing is, as we already said, you're building out your own little district within Burano. You've been given the task from the city commission to build these buildings. Each of these buildings are going to come in three different levels. You have a ground floor, a second floor, and then a third level floor. Yeah, there's a ton of different icons on here. And the cool thing is the scoring isn't the same every single time for people because these tourists and inhabitants, they're the ones who are going to give you scoring. Throughout the game, you're going to be able to grab those when you can to score in unique ways. So my scoring will be very different than Jeremy's at the end of the game. One of the great things too about each of these different stacks, your tourists and your inhabitants, they come in a very limited quantity. So it's a first come first serve depending upon the number of players that are participating. You're also gonna have an X number of columns with random distributed third, second, and ground level floors, depending upon the number of players. We have a three player game set up, so there's four columns, which is one more than the number of players. We're each gonna start with four coins. This is you to actually build buildings into your district. And we're also gonna start with scaffolds, which allow you to get around some of the building restrictions within the game itself. All right, to play the game, it's very simple. You have two things that you do on your turn. The first thing is you must take at least one card from one of the columns. Now, the trick here is no matter where you take cards, they all have to be from one one column. You can't take a middle card from one place and a, and a ground level floor from a different place. You're choosing to take one, two, or three cards. If you take one card, you get two coins. If you take two cards, you get one coin. If you take three cards from that column, you're going to get no money. That's yeah, the trick. You have to be careful too because you can't take just the middle floor of the buildings. You have to take, if you're going to take that middle floor, you've got to take either the top or the bottom as well. So you're going to have to pick and choose what you're taking. It's a puzzle with what you're taking in addition to when you're building it in front of you. Exactly. Also, when players take these, they're not going to be refilled until the end of the round. So it's going to be a first come first serve with the first player getting a, a juicier pick of those. And by the time it gets to that last player, they're going to have very few things to choose from. All right, so once you have taken one, two or three cards, you then get to play one, two or three cards into your district. This is going to cost you coin that you've previously collected. If you play one card, it's one coin. If you play two cards, it's three coin. And if you play all three cards, it's going to cost you five coin. There's a couple rules that you have to pay attention to when you place cards. Number one, you have to play adjacent to previously built cards. You can never skip columns. At the end of the game, you're going to have a three by five grid. I mean, you're going to have five buildings that are three high. Yeah, and this is too where the scaffolding is, can come in. Because when you take different colored cards and you want to build them, you might have to skip a floor. So you can put a scaffolding on a second floor in order to put that third floor on it, hoping to get that second floor color that you need later in the game. However, you can break two cardinal rules. The main rules are that you have to have building structures that are all the same color. So you have to have blue buildings or red buildings or orange buildings and so forth. Also, you can never build a blue building next to another adjacent blue building. That would also be breaking the rules. You can get around that. And to do so, each player is going to have four of these regulatory tokens. These are each worth three victory points at the end of the game if you haven't to use them. However, you can get rid of these to break both of those rules. That means you can place a green building above a ground floor that's blue, or you could place two green buildings that are next to each other. Yeah, that's going to come into play a couple different reasons. One, you might look at the tableau on the, on the board and realize there's not many cards you can take to build onto the buildings you've already started. The second reason is it comes down to math. You could look at one of the things you're trying to score, and if you're going to score more points by breaking the rule than three that you lose for using one of those, then that's a decision that you need to make. So how do you score points? Once you have built a complete building, meaning you have the ground, second, and third floor built, you're allowed to take any one of the inhabitant cards or any one of the tourist cards. They work a little bit differently. Your tourists are going to give you a native just two victory points flat out. Plus, they're only going to score the building they're directly under. So some of them are going to give you victory points for every cat in that building, for the different color plants or flowers you have, and so forth. So you want to build those strategically. Also, it's first come, first serve. Your inhabitants, however, are going to score for your entire district at the end of the game. Yeah, the inhabitants, you're going to look at the entire district, but some of them score a little bit differently. You're going to be looking at groupings of three 
that are adjacent next to each other. Again, scoring for a lot of the same things that the tourists score for, but some other things as well. Yeah, I mean, you have things here like Santa who scores for your chimneys, which is really cool. Yeah. You have the mayor here who scores for pedestrians that are littered across your ground floors. All right, so once that round is done, you're going to, uh, depending on the number of players, if you have two players or three players or four players, some of these cards will be discarded. All of them will move down to the right and you're gonna refill these. So you're always gonna get a different assortment of cards when they come out. Your little cat token, which is your first player token, is gonna pass to the player to the left. And you're gonna keep doing this round after round until one player has been built a five by three grid. That's going to signify the end of the game. And then everybody at the table is going to score according to those five building columns if they have somebody below them. And that's either the inhabitants or the tourists. Yeah, so it's entirely possible that one person might have a complete grid and other players might not be able to finish that grid. It just depends on how many cards they'd held in their hand and not played towards the end of the game. All right, so that is Walking in Burano from Emperor S4. Let's talk about the actual review. Let's go for our positives first. Yeah. One of the main things I love about this game is that it's a point, it's a complete point salad, and it's very deceptive. When you first look at the game, you think, wow, it's colorful, It's it looks like it's a family-friendly game, which it is for the most part, but there's a lot of different scoring structures in here, and a lot of things that you're thinking about future turns in advance. So this isn't a simple game where you're just plotting some building out. You're thinking, I can get this card, which is gonna allow me to get this card, but I have to, in order to in order to do that, I have to complete this building before another player because all of these points are going to score. Yeah, it's the tension that you just touched on that's really significant to me because you can score something like cats in a building, but if you look at your competitors and they're all stacking cats in a building, you better hope you finish your building before they do because in a three-player game right here, we have two of these tourists that do that. Mm -hmm. If they're gone, then you're going to have to figure out something else that you want to score for. And the, all of these, tourists or the inhabitants, are all exactly like that. You want to look at that and go, okay, I'm going to score that. But if someone else scores it before you, you might be out of luck. Which leads me to another positive is the amount of decisions in this game is, again, very deceptive. When you start playing the game, your mind automatically clicks into that you know, I, I'm part of the city and I want to make my city look pretty. I want to have blue buildings and I want to have yellow buildings. But when you start looking around the board and you see people about to complete something and snatch one of those cards you need, you start using these regulatory committees like, like it's water in order to build really weird buildings, but in order to make up those points with these by getting them before other players. So there's a lot of thought in this game that's, again, very deceptive. Yeah, that's a good point. Those regulatory tokens can be used, you got to keep in mind the points you're going to score by using one, but also the points that you're going to keep someone else from scoring potentially as well. There's also something to said for the look of the game. It's beautiful yeah. art, it's very colorful, it's colorblind friendly too for people. All of these different buildings have little icons on them for those people like myself who can't really see some of the colors, especially your orange and your reds that are very similar to each other. So when it's on the table and you start building out the structure, it looks very cool. Yeah, it's a gorgeous game. I, this is one thing I definitely want to point out too. The components, I, I think they've done this before in their games. They put like a, a foil, a metallic foil on their coin tokens. So even though they're cardboard still, they have a really nice shine to them. It really, it's a little extra something for sure. The last thing I'll say is that the game uh, will appeal to both families, I think, and also to enthusiast gamers because as we said, you can deep dive into this game and find a lot of different combinations of things, a lot of different ways to score points, but also it's really easy to teach. It's really easy to learn. Anybody can play this. It's aged at 10 plus, but I can see kids that are six, seven, eight years old being able to play this without any problem. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I really like the game. I like the way it looks. I like all of the decision-making. It's probably just enough decision-making. I mean, if we wanna start with the cons, mm -hmm. I think one of the cons I would say is in that decision-making, um, particularly in a group that's bigger, uh, it could potentially start to slow down a little bit yep. because of AP, depending on the players. I, I think you'd have to be AP prone to really try to overthink this because the, the choices are fairly limited. Mm -hmm. It's getting consumed, too consumed with all these different scoring opportunities that are going to get people to going, oh, I'm going to go after that. Oh, wait a minute. Should that I go after this? One more point or two more and, points. And, and mathing mm -hmm. out those things. Yeah. Now, Thankfully, the math is not terribly complicated, mm -hmm. so you can do that pretty quickly. But that possibility does exist there. And I would say another, and I, I hesitate to call this a con, but given these, I think after a few plays, these scoring uh, cards could become almost maybe a little too familiar. I think it would have been cool had they had maybe 
a wider selection and you randomly pull out seven of these uh, and maybe there are some other ones in the box. Yeah, I agree. There probably could have been more inhabitants and more tourists that come out. Also, I'm very surprised that the game doesn't have a scoring structure for building colored yeah colored, yeah, yep. colored houses if your whole city is is colored according to what Bronner really looks like you don't really get any points for yeah, it. the variety you just get the satisfaction that hey my city looks pretty cool right <laughs> right so there's that as well and I, I do wish there was more scoring in there as well however having said that this is a really cool game yeah. like I did not expect this we got this in realms of sand and I gotta say this is the game that I would choose to pick because it's it's very simple mm -hmm. it's fun and then I love the math in this game it's like you said it's simple to yeah it is a great little game it's easy to teach and like the city of Burano itself, it is absolutely beautiful on the table. Walking in Burano, I believe it's an Essen release. It is one to four players, so you can play it solo if you wish. It takes about 30 minutes. You're in and out very quick. If you guys have any questions about the game, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.